It's time for tight ends. Combine NFL and college prospect rankings and tiers. Next on the Football Guys College Football Show. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Football Guys here at the YouTube channel, College Football Show, but more Dynasty right now. So we're diving into kind of, we went through the quarterback tiers, we've gone to the running back and wide receiver tiers. Now it's everyone's favorite topic, tight ends. Do not exit out of this video right now and stop listening. We're going to make tight ends fun, I promise. And if we don't, we're going to fire Jeff Bell. That's that's the deal there. So that's even more exciting. You can stick to the end to see if Jeff's going to come back next week. So um, we're going to be diving into the tiers, going through that. Make sure you hit, a like, um, you hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment. Let us know what you think about the tight ends. There's really just a few tight ends and then nothing else. But we're going to get into it. We're going to have some um, exciting talks. So let's get into tier one. So when we're looking at the tight end position, very top heavy. So obviously we're going to be going into that. And then where are these tier breaks at, especially right now in Dynasty, um, for these guys? So our tier one, we have Kyle Pitts at one, which, hey, some people might yell at us right now because he's not going one in Dynasty drafts. From what I, from from basically what I've seen, even in, in tight end premium, Pitts kind of is teetering around tight end three and four, actually, in, in, some, in some drafts there. We have Mark Andrews at two and then Travis Kelsey at three. That's the end of our tier there. So let's get into pits. And as the pits guy on this show, Jeff, uh, you 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 pounded that table before. Um, should we have him here, or should we not have him here, or is this just by default? You just dynasty pits. He's the guy. This is the most. This is one of the most difficult things for me in dynasty fantasy football right now is the treatment of Kyle Pitts relative to uh, Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey. And um, Kel it's difficult for me to put. Kelsey at number one, um, because we are, we are, let's be realistic. We are one injury season away or one production slowdown season away from Kelsey, from people freaking out hardcore and him dropping 10 spots down the rankings because of his age. And, that, and that's the reality of the situation. He's still crushing year after year, but you know, I mean, Tony Gonzalez eventually slowed down eventually. And so, uh, that's the guy that comes to mind of a guy that, played late into his thirties. And so that, that is the one thing on Kelsey that I think kind of it's teetering pits. It's difficult because outside of the Falcons dramatically increasing their passing volume, I think what you're going to see and it's good for pits is you're going to see a very narrow target tree between pits, Drake London and Bajan Robinson is primarily what the Falcons yeah. are going to use. And so if Desmond Ritter can get comfortable and he showed some flashes of that last year. He showed some flashes of having higher volume than what Marcus Mariota had. And if, if they can keep that tight, tight target tree and kind of move him up a little bit, it doesn't take much from the tight end position for Pitts to really start to pay off on, on value. And, but again, it's, there's going to be at least most definitely this year and probably the next couple of years, Travis Kelsey is going to outproduce him by a considerable margin. Yeah, and and I think this goes back to you know the the struggle with I can't remember the player that we talked about last week, but it, there was we had a nice conversation on the wide receiver show about you know it, leaning younger, and the the fact of the matter is Kyle Pitts is eleven years younger than Travis Kelsey, and you know when you're looking at what a dynasty tight end's lifespan is, and when you're looking at Kyle Pitts was a thousand yard receiver as, as a rookie. And obviously he battled injuries last year. And so I think that definitely impacts everyone's view of him, but I think you're pretty comfortably getting a top six guy, even with some of those questions that we still have about the Atlanta offense. Now I, I do have faith that the Atlanta offense is going to actually throw a little bit more. Um, you know, they, they had more attempts with Desmond Ritter under center. They looked more comfortable giving him the football. Uh, this is something I talked about with the, the Drake London discussion last week, but you know, it, it definitely has to be the highest form of the Arthur Smith offense for him to be the one. And so, and I don't actually think the one is in his range of outcomes this year, but with Dynasty, and, and this is the, the tough part, you have to project forward. And like Jeff said, we're very, very close to the twilight years of, of Travis Kelsey's career. Now, I think you can argue that he's still got it. He, um, he really didn't slow down a whole lot last year, and I think the offense is still going to revolve around him this year. But you can see how the Chiefs are kind of starting to, to transition 
to a, a world without him and, and just going and getting, I know it's been day two receivers the last two years, but they are certainly trying to add to that room. And, and while Kelsey is the focal point, I think we could be moving toward a world in which he's not here in two years, three years, maybe. Yeah. And, and in reality, he might retire too. Like there was some rumors that he was going to retire this last year. Um, if they don't win the Super Bowl, maybe he does, right? Or whatever the case may be. Um, and then maybe he's out after this year. So I, I do think that when you're looking at Kelsey, I think that's something to note. I know Jeff brought up Tony Gonzalez. And one thing I like to pull up is what Tony Gonzalez did at the end of his career. He was really, really efficient and he didn't miss games. So his last, um, the last six game or six years of his career, he played 16 games every game of the year. And so you saw that and it did dip a little bit, but even his last year, like I think he was 37 his last year, 83 catches, 859 yards and eight touchdowns. And right now that'd be what tied in five probably or something like that. So like if you, if you're looking projecting Kelsey there, I think the biggest thing, I don't know if it's an injury or anything slowing down. I think it's retirement. I think that he's going to get to a point like Gronk did of like, Hey, why do I got to be here and do these things? I do want to touch on Mark Andrews. Um, I love Mark Andrews this year. I think he's tied in one this year. I know I have a hot take there. I just wrote a spotlight on Lamar and the way they use tied in utilization in Todd Munkin's offense. And I'm telling you right now, he's going to get targets and they're going to really utilize this entire crew. And then you saw that. I mean, last year, obviously, he did have a really good six games. He had four, 39 catches, 455 yards and five touchdowns. But with Lamar out, there's a lot of issues going on there. I do think that he's the guy to target if you don't want to go pits, if you're concerned about that. I think Andrew's 27, three or four years of elite. You're looking at that like that's the guy um, that I would have there um, in terms of that offense. Any take on Mark? I think he's the guy to target to buy if you're looking to trade into the top tier, if you're looking to make a move um, because some of the narratives around his production last year, he was hurt last year. Let's be real. He was hurt. He came back and then they had Tyler Huntley as quarterback for the end part of the year. He, it just was not conducive to production. And so I, I've already in leagues, I've, I've made trades for Mark Andrews because he is obtainable, but he is also that elite asset. And he kind of sp spreads the middle there between these two players where he's got a runway of a, a still prime production window. He's got a great offensive system set up. And I, I think that I also think he's going to dominate in targets this year. And uh, he doesn't have some of that immediacy risk of Travis Kelsey yeah. where um, it's, Kelsey's difficult uh, because I think he's going to retire on your roster if you got him on your roster, unless you can get really something special for him because you you don't know when that cliff is going to come. Um, but at the same time, it's just he is such a difference maker that having him pushes you out ahead of, of competition. Yeah. Just quick note on Mark Andrews. I think it, you know, we keep mentioning the Todd Monk and offense, and I think we've gone into it a little bit, but. What that essentially means is this is not this is not the the Greg Roman run eight million no. times a game offense anymore. They are going to throw the ball, and so you know, yes, the Ravens added wide receivers, and yes, you know, some of those receivers are a lot better than what they've had in the last couple of years. But there will be more of a, a share to go around, and even if you know, even in the instance that Mark Andrews doesn't have a, a crazy target share the volume is going to catch up. And so I, I think you're looking, I think you guys are spot on on Andrews and I, I have also been targeting him. I, you know, luckily held on to him through some of that in, in my leagues last year. Cause I was a big Andrews guy the year before. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's where I struggle though. And, and bring this back to Pitts is like, is in, in the next three years, is Pitts going to outperform Andrews is uh, you know, does Kelsey not retire in that in that time frame? And that's, you know, that's the struggle. And, um, you know, this is an, an, an interesting tier break, too, because of where we have our, our number four guy who I can't wait to talk about. Yeah, let's let's get into it real quick. Last note on um, Monken system with tight ends. Last year, Georgia tight end Brock Bowers led the nation in screen targets, and in those, in in, in that, and they had over a hundred screen passes um, to every, you know, to the running backs, wide receiver, and tight end position. But in that time, he, he had over almost a thousand yards receiving, seven touchdowns, and that's Brock Bowers. Mark Andrews has shown that he could do that. So that's just something to note um, real quick. All right, let's go to tier two then. So tier two, we have Brock Bowers, who I just talked about. Georgia tight end, 6'4", 230, has definitely kind of taken that toll as being that tight end one. Uh, there's question marks, but we'll get into it. Uh, five is TJ Hawkinson. And then six is George Kittle. And I will be honest, everybody out there listening and, and to watching, Kittle's the hardest for me 
Kittle is the one that's the hardest for me to rank, and I'm avoiding in dynasty drafts. So I'll be honest there too. Um, but we have to put him in this tier because he was like borderline what tight end one the last few weeks of the season last year. So he did put that up. So that's something to note. Um, where do you want to go with this one, Christian? Go ahead and talk about whoever you want to get into. I think it's Brock Powers. Let's let's start with Brock Powers because that's definitely a name that you know not everyone watching the show will will have known or or heard of. Um, Bowers to me is one of those interesting cases of how much does this size matter and can he play as a traditional tight end at the NFL level? Because as you said, 230 pounds, that's not typically a guy that you put in line, but then you watch Brock Bowers play and you're like, well, you know, blocking technique is all there. He holds his own in the run game and he, you know, they, Georgia had a, 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 a tempered rushing attack last year, but they used him as a puller on some plays and he would get into guys. And so when you see things like that, you, I feel more reassured knowing what kind of weapon he can be utilized as at the NFL level, knowing that I think he can stay on the field or assuming that he can stay on the field um, and not just be that like tight end two type where, you know, he's just used as a big slot or, yeah. uh, you know, I think some of the questions about Dalton Kincaid this year are going to apply uh, a bit to Brock Bowers, except Dalton Kincaid was even a little bigger than what Brock Bowers is. So I think when we get down to it, when we get to NFL combine time, uh, you know, I'd like to see maybe that number be a 240. And Georgia's not very good about updating their numbers. There's a chance that Brock Bowers is, you know, 10 pounds heavier already. But as a weapon, you know, this guy is an elite pass catcher. We talk about Kyle Pitts and and what his profile was and how he caught every ball thrown to him at Florida, I believe, or all but two or something insane like that. Brock Bowers is similar and he's got the yards after the catch and he's got the catch point stuff. And, you know, you're looking at a guy that can be an elite fantasy asset, similar to what even Travis Kelsey has been over the last few years. I hesitate. I We always fall into this trap on – young tight ends. And, and so, but at the same time, uh, I've talked a lot on this program. We've talked a lot on this program about the proliferation of 12 personnel and the usage of yeah. multiple tight end sets. And I think that you've got a handful of young tight ends right now, guys, like you mentioned Dalton Kincaid. That's a great pull there. Chigo Conquo is one. Certainly Greg Dolchich is one. I think Trey McBride might be one where uh, these guys are set up to be those big slot receivers and, and those types of that second tight end that um, is not your traditional tight end. And th those guys are set up to deliver on that this year. And if they do, it is prime time for Brock Bowers because we know this is a copycat league. And so I do think that as you look around the league, the players that are set to take off are those types of players that yeah. allow for those 12 personnel that they, you break them from the line, you treat, swing them outside. My guy, I always mention him, Isaiah likely as another guy like that. I think it has that ability. If those guys hit, then I think you're talking about Bowers being potentially a top 10 pick. If we fall into that trap again, where we're hoping that young tight ends do something and they just kind of don't. And we're asking a lot out of some of these players to change their games, to be that type of player, especially to be a focal element in the passing game at this stage in their career. We're asking a lot of out of that. And so they all could fall flat on their face, to be honest with you. Uh, but again, I, I do think it is prime. It is set up where Bowers could realize that immediate value and, and be viewed as that chess piece that, uh, you know, the queen, the queen on the chessboard that you can move around. And, and so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, I've had my hesitations with Brock and because of his size, but you guys bring up good points. And I, and I do think this is a correct tier for him, though, because if he hits at his ceiling, he's a top six guy already. Like, that's just kind of how he's going to come into the league. And if he does get, I mean, top 10, I think is, that's a little, he that's, 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 that's rich. Uh, but if he does get in there, yeah, he'll be there. But I mean, if the thing is, this is the thing I struggle with tight ends, though, because there's going to be somebody that pops off in this class that, maybe he gets drafted ahead of him right we saw that with michael mayer and i understand like the i understand the different and i mowers is is a different type of athlete than the mayor was um but there is that to it's to, you know to the to the puzzle and I, and I think that's the question mark but i don't mind him here i think tier two is fine um 
let's get to Kittle. So let's talk about Kittle real quick. What? So Kittle, Kittle had a weird year last year, boys. So he had 11 high touchdowns or a career high, 11 touchdowns last year, but he only averaged 51 yard receiving per game. So he was very efficient, caught a lot of touchdowns. And then towards the end of the year, I mean, he had two big games, really. That's really where it was uh, against Washington. He had 120 yards. Uh, and again, those two touchdowns. And in Seattle, he had 93 yards and two touchdowns. But outside of that, kind of inefficient he had three games where we had two touchdowns that year so like you see that you saw the points um but then you know what he's doing he's competing against Debo a healthy Debo he's competing against Ayuk who both me and Christian like um and then Christian McCaffrey again so he has a lot of the target share is going to be interesting I don't know if you guys have done your projections yet um I'm not but I know you guys are working on those so like I don't know how, how that looks but that's I think the question he's 29 where do you get him at in dynasty in terms of this like he feels like he's dynasty <clears throat> excuse me purgatory like you draft him and you're hoping like, hey, if someone gets injured, he'll get that target share there. Um, but that's my question with Kittle. Like, should he maybe be a little lower, right? Like, I don't know. I, <clears throat> I'm i okay with him at six, um, but I'm not, I, I know Jeff's not drafting this dude in Dynasty. Jeff has not drafted a guy over 25 in Dynasty in years. Um, so like, what, what are you, what are we doing with Kittle, Jeff? I mean, I would land at this value. I land at fate. I've got him projected for about 80 targets to be on. And yeah. um, I, I think that the, I expect the 49ers to run a lot more if Trey Lance is the quarterback, or even if it's Brock Purdy, I think that they're going to skew towards the um, run side of things. I think that Debo okay. Samuel's mm -hmm. comments here, I don't know if it's today or yesterday talking about how he was out of shape last year and how he's not going to do that again. I think that he's motivated and I think they're going to plug him back in. I Come on, we've all said that, Jeff. Come on, we've all said I was uh, we're out of shape, but I'm getting back into it, baby. I'm coming back. <laughs> yeah, but, but no, I think it's um, it, it, that's just where I land, kind of, uh, and it's going to be a lower volume, I think, for Kittle. And you're really hoping now he does have, like you said, he does have the uh, explosives in his game, uh, and that he can deliver those long touchdowns. He can deliver those multiple touchdown games, especially inside this offense. And I think that that's really what you're hoping for at this point. Uh, I just don't outside of an in now that said one injury could change the San Francisco yes. offense quite a bit because I, I do think that there is a pretty steep fall off at every single position outside of having McCaffrey, having Brandon Ayuk and having Debo Samuel along with Kittle, one of those guys out of the lineup and you don't have a fourth guy in, anymore. I mean, Juwan Johnson's, he's an okay football player, but he's not going to be dictating any sort of passing volume. And so, and you're, you're betting on, I, I mean, are you going to bet on George Kittle, Debo Samuel and uh, Christian McCaffrey to not miss any time? Um, you, you know, I, they're going to miss some time. Second straight week, Christian, he's, he's, be smirched the name of Elijah Mitchell. We're just going to not let this go. Cause if Elijah Mitchell becomes a running back, not too, throw him the football. If he's <laughs> on the field, I'm telling you right now. All right. What do you got, Christian? What do you think here? I think 80 targets is fair. Cause he had 86 last year. So like, I understand that. So I give him 88 for this year. And I think there's a, there's a lot of things that contribute to that. You know, they didn't have Christian McCaffrey the full year last year. Uh, but I think a lot of what it boils down to for Kittle is who wins that job. I think, you know, if Trey Lance wins that job, I think we're looking at a less efficient Kittle. Uh, I think probably Brock Purdy is the best thing for Kittle. We did see that down the stretch. Now, I do project that Trey Lance will win that job, which is why, you know, I have uh, Kittle's target share down below 20%. I have him at the fourth highest target getter on the team. But with the tight end landscape, he still finished, you know, on a points per game basis, he, he's finishing, he's finishing inside my top five. And so that's just kind of what the tight end landscape lends itself to is even an inefficient George Kittle. Now the, the main kicker here is the touchdowns. The touchdown rate with Brock Purdy was super high. I don't know if that sticks with Trey Lance. We don't have a huge sample size, but if it is Brock Purdy, I think you're looking at George Kittle could potentially finish as a top two tight end. Um, and so when you start to factor that in, when you look at what this tier looks like, I think six is about right. You know, we just talked about Travis Kelsey potentially retiring. I, I think Kittle is right on that border yeah. too, with all the injuries and things like that. So uh, that's why I think, yeah, you know, I'd probably be comfortable drafting him ahead of, you know, maybe even Hawkinson this year, I, I think is where I have him. Um, but I just, you know, when you factor in the age and, and the risk of retirement, I think this is a perfect spot for him. 
Yeah. All right. And then that last guy in this little tier here is Hawkinson. Hawkinson, we saw tied into last year um, as he got traded to the Minnesota Vikings. So we saw that, you know, he finished with about 13.3 average uh, points per game, which, you know, puts him at, it puts him at two. So he, he definitely did perform. Um, he was still almost a hundred points behind Kelsey, which is just still insane to look at. Like that stuff is just crazy to me. He did. No, he had 128 targets last year. So when you saw the targets, Hey, that's the second most in the NFL from last season. Now, the one thing with them is they added Jordan Addison. What is that going to look like for him? What's that market share and target share look like? What do we think with, with Hawkinson again I'm just I feel like I'm the biggest like anti-Hawkinson guy out there all every year like to me he's a sell 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 um but am I crazy Jeff where are you going with Hawk I actually really like Hawkinson I'm projecting him around 120 targets I think that um one I think the Vikings are going to throw the ball quite a bit I think the Vikings are going to threaten to be one of the most pass heavy offenses in the NFL especially if they lose Dalvin Cook the other thing if they lose Dalvin Cook I don't know how involved the running backs will be in the passing game. I think that you could see targets be pretty narrow just to the to Hawkinson and to the three wide receivers. I put KJ Osborne in there as well. I think he'll be involved too. And and we've seen in the past this Kevin O'Connell offense, the offshoot of the Sean um, McVay offense. They like to use a lot of eleven personnel. They like to go with those three wide receiver sets. And so I that's what I expect this offense to be. Those three wide receiver sets, minimal. If it's not Dalvin Cook, definitely minimal passing game involvement for the running back and plenty of volume for all four of the other passing options because that, and that's really what you're looking for. I think that you love target trees that have just two top options, but um, if you get to three, you can kind of live with and, and four, if four needs to be volume and I think the Vikings yeah. will be there on volume. Yeah, I spoke out of turn. Uh, I should have been looking at my rankings. I would definitely draft Hawkinson over Kittle this year. Um, you know, I started to look at it. So I have them about a point per game apart. Um, I think, you know, I think the Addison addition actually does help Hawkinson. I don't think they work in the same areas necessarily. I do think that Dalvin Cook point is key because that's, you know, those running backs would work in those same areas. And you you wonder how much of the, the target share would go to Alexander Madison. Ty Chandler, I think, could factor in as like a passing down back. Uh, but those players just don't move the needle in terms of uh, what they can do after the catch and what they can do and what Hawkinson showed us that he could do within that offense. And when you take the Kevin O'Connell offense back to where it originated back in, in L.A. and what he made Tyler Higby into for a year, I, I th well, Higby showed that he could sustain that after he left, but – I think you know that the tight end is going to get a lot of work in this Vikings offense. So Hawk, I'm in on Hawkinson, and that means, you know, this could be – I think he's one of those guys that has the potential to jump up uh, and be in that tier one, especially once Kelsey uh, is, is done. So. All right. Well, I got some trades for you, Jeff, so let's see what you got. I got two trades. Who would you rather have? Because I said he's a sell. This is tight end premium both, okay? And it's 1.75 tight end premium just for everybody out there. Superflex, PPR, 1.75 tight end premium. TJ Hawk or J.K. Dobbins? Straight up. I would rather have TJ Hawkinson. Okay. TJ Hawkinson okay. or Garrett Wilson? Because that had to happen. TJ Hawkinson or Garrett Wilson? Garrett it, Wilson. Happened, it happened in an MFL league, so that's it popped up. So Garrett Wilson, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah so the, there are bad managers out there, everybody. So the, the only <laughs> bad trade you send is the one you don't send. So there are times out there just to give you guys an idea uh, of where that is going. But there was also a deal with TJ Hawkinson for Tony Pollard and George Kittle. If we project Kittle just right underneath that, he stays healthy and you get Tony Pollard for a year, I could see that deal. And in the way I look at tiers, if they're in the same tier for me, if I can get an asset like that, I don't mind moving it. Maybe it depends. Like when he, when Christian talks about him tearing up, that's where you get concerned that maybe I miss Hawkinson. He tears in that tier one and I'm left holding Kittle's bones um, as he retires or whatever the case may be. All right, let's go over to tier three. So let's look at uh, this one quick one because only two players here. Dallas Goddard and then Pat Fryermuth are both in our tier um, three here. Where, where do we, and, and this is also a question, like where do we get into where like, ah, these guys don't matter. I'm just going to wait until tier five uh, or tier four. Like where, where are we getting in this area? Are we close to that? Or are you, are you still okay drafting these guys at, at their current ADP, Jeff? I, I like both of them. Um, to be okay. honest with you, I, I've been ending up with 
um, either of these players quite frequently. I and I have them both above George Kittle to to be clear in dynasty rankings. Um, I think that um, Fryermuth, we've seen the involvement, and, I, and I'm kind of frankly encouraged about the addition of Darnell Washington because I don't expect him to be threatening to take any targets. But that's another low key team that could be transitioning to more 12 personnel than what they've run traditionally in the past, keeping Washington as that sixth offensive lineman and starting to use Fryermuth as that big slot. I think that that's an, uh, something that isn't really mentioned quite often and i think that could be the case because that's another team that has traditionally run three wide receivers outside of having the addition of Allen robinson they are really questionable on who that third wide receiver could be beyond Allen robinson and so i think that 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 allows them to get back to that old school Steelers mentality of running the football down your throat and, and loading up and being able to take some shots downfield for especially George Pickens. But that keeps Fryermuth on the field and that brings Washington in and that breaks Fryermuth free to be more of a receiving option. And so I've, I've got Fryermuth above Kittle and uh, Goddard is another one too. Like we, we know exactly what, the Eagles passing tree should hypothetically look like because nobody missed time last year, except for Goddard missed a little bit of time. Um, but they're very, very target, very narrow between those top two wide receivers and Goddard. And and you love to have that type of clarity. Yeah. With him, I, I wonder what the Deandre Swift involvement looks like, yes. uh, because I do think that they want, they got him so they could, uh, you know, use him in the passing game where he's good. Uh, and I do, uh, Goddard is one of those interesting guys though, where he doesn't primarily or exclusively work in the underneath stuff. You know, he's, he's able to stretch the field and, and run sail routes and things like that. Um, and they're creative enough. The Friar Muth point, here's where I struggle though, because like you said, Jeff, they want to get back to that Pittsburgh Steelers run the football then you couple that with Kenny Pickett being a fairly inefficient quarterback. Now I I'm projecting him to take a little bit of, of a leap this year, but you know, that's limited. I, I don't know what kind of leap Kenny Pickett is capable of. And then you start to factor in, okay, well, so you've got your Deontay Johnson targets. And then I, I think George Pickens is going to get a, a hefty target share. You got a pretty nice one last year. I think yeah. he's set for a second year leap, even if I don't think he's the greatest fantasy asset, maybe a little bit overrated right now. Then you start to look at, well, Najee Harris is also going to get his. And so is Pat Fryermuth the fourth option in that passing attack? And then if if you're looking at the fourth option in a passing attack, you want them to be in an efficient offense that scores a lot of touchdowns, that is consistently going to look to the end zone uh, or get in the end zone and look for the tight end position. I'm not as much of a Fryermuth guy as I am, and I do have him ranked highly in Dynasty still because I think that he could overcome a lot of those things. And maybe, you know, year three pick it, year four pick it, we're looking at more substantial growth. It's just, I would, I feel like I need to temper the expectations for frying with this year because of the, the situation um, that said, fantastic football player. You know, if Kyle Pitts didn't exist, that he would have been a very, very high pick in that draft, I think, and, and probably in the Pitts range. Um, so it, that he's a tough one for me. Yeah, to wrap up both of these points, you know, Goddard, to your credit, like 13.8 yards per catch over the last two years. So, yeah, he's that you, you, you talked about that stress of field does that. I think the issue is the Eagles were the fourth um, run heaviest team in the league, and he hasn't scored more than five touchdowns his entire career in a season. And I think that's where you get where Fryer Booth probably the red zone. Like, OK, maybe he's going to do that. I know he only scored two touchdowns, but possibly there. I just have a hard time with Kenny Pickett. I'll be honest. Like I just have a hard time with passing offense led by Kenny Pickett. And I think that's where I, my hesitation comes a little bit there. Um, and then I have a hard time with their run heavy offense with AJ Brown and Devonta Smith. And now you have Swift there and it's like, okay, where are these targets going to come from? And the inefficiency in the red zone for, for Goddard. I think those are all the things that like I kind of sit back on and say, I don't know if I want to draft this tier here. I think there's some next guys in tier four where I don't necessarily have to reach up an ADP and I can go grab those guys, but that's just my limitation there. Anything left on these guys? Nope. No. All right. Let's get to our massive tier four. So we have a bunch of guys here um, in this tier to kind of go through. So I'll just read them off and then we'll jump in. Nine is Michael Mayer. 10 is David Njoku. 11 is Dalton Kincaid. 12 is Evan Ingram. 
13 is Trey McBride. 14 is Dalton Schultz. 15 is Sam Laporta. 16 is Darren Waller. 17 is Greg Dolchitz. And if you squinted your eyes, they are all the same tight end. So what the hell are we doing with these guys when you go through this, this area? I talked about, I tweeted out a couple of days ago. I said, well, I don't know what the hell to do with David Njoku and Dynasty. I have met 10, I think, or 11. But then somebody responded with literally probably all of these guys and said, they're all kind of the same. So what do we do here? Um, let's just go with this. Is there a guy that stands out to you, Jeff, that you feel like could maybe tear up or have a big 2023? Well, I, I just want to know who did it to Dalton Kincaid, to be honest with you, because I've got him as a dynasty tight end five in, in my I wonder rating. why. Why do you have him as a dynasty tight end five? Who does he play for, Jeff? <laughs> because he could, he could, in a year or two, he could be the primary receiving option for Josh Allen offense. I mean, they are not going to just not have the wide receiver for a Josh Allen led mm-hmm. offense. I'm just saying he, it's in play. It's, I don't it's, know. I don't know who did this to him. We're going to get yelled at in the comments below, but what, what, what's your take with Kincaid then? Like, what do you have? I think this year, I think this year will be quieter. And I think people will be disappointed this year. And I think that he's going to be pretty close to in line with um, Dawson Knox this year, to be honest with you in production, because I think that they're going to use that position. Um, I think that what you're going to see, what you've seen over the last two years in this Bills offense is they run base offense with Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis, and Dawson Knox don't really come off the field. And they use Davis to stretch vertically. They have Knox as the tight end and then Diggs is Diggs. And then they use that fourth kind of spot to run rotate between having a fullback out there, having 12 personnel potentially, or having a traditional slot receiver, those types of players. So I think that you're going to see some of that cycling still. And I think that in Lusk and Cade really develops very, very quickly this year. I think he's going to be cycling between him and having um, Deontay Hardy playing some, having Khalil Shakir playing some, and, and having Reggie Gillum as a traditional fullback playing a little bit too with a little bit more power with the addition of Damian Harris. And so that that's kind of where I land on Kincaid this year. I think that he's going to, unless he just pops and they run that base personnel and he just stays on the field and kind of deletes those other guys out of there. And if that's the case, um, then you could have a great immediate return as a rookie. But I think that, that that's asking a lot with the transition that he's making to kind of being that big slot receiver. Um, now, long term, as he develops, I think that's the direction that they want to be in that offense. And so that's where I'm excited and intrigued because as he develops into that additional piece that you can move around, talk about that again, uh, that becomes a situation where you can leave him on in base personnel. And then all of a sudden you can run big packages or spread packages with the same players on the field. And so that's long-term, I think where they want to get to, but I think that's asking a lot his rookie season to get there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Kincaid's a top, I mean, he's, he's 11 for us. I, I think, I have him ranked right around here for this year and I'm higher on him this year than I think Jeff even is. Um, But I, you know, I think Kevin put it in the best word. I think a lot of these guys are very similar and they have similar ranges of outcomes. You know, a guy like Dalton Schultz who everyone faded and then they drafted CJ Stroud. And it's like, well, look at where that offense is. If, if Stroud finds a favorite target and it's Dalton Schultz, we could be looking at another, you know, top five finish for Dalton Schultz. Um, Same thing with Darren Waller and and Daniel Jones over there. And I think, you know, Trey McBride is expected to take a a second year leap, but, you know, I think I'd, I'd probably hesitate on that one uh, just with what that offense looks like this year. But there are just a lot of guys that have similar ranges of outcomes here Um, in terms of, Moving forward, I think, you know, you, Kevin, you mentioned Najoku. I, I, that's one that stands out to me is a guy that's tied to probably the second most elite offense here. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to look. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think you can argue Evan Engram too, but I think, you know, the, the target competition for him is a little bit uh, greater than what Najoku has. I know, you know, there's been some DeAndre Hopkins buzz and, and you know, he may sign before this is uh, released and I'll look silly, but you know, I think Amari Cooper is the primary. I think Elijah Moore is turning into a a nice secondary piece, but I think Najoku is also going to get his and have a nice few year stretch. Deshaun Watson loves using his tight end. And so when I stack those up and when you look at what their, their price point is and in acquiring them in dynasty startups, you know, I'll just sit and I'll wait for Najoku uh, instead of reaching on Kincaid a little bit, because I do think that there is a, a discrepancy in their ADP right now. 
Yeah, it, I, the hard part about this group, like you guys have mentioned, it's just it's just like you know who who's tied to the best offense. I'll just roll with that, and that's why Njoku to me stood out, and I, I keep talking about him. Mayor as well. I, I like Mayor more than Kincaid. I'll be honest. And that's just me being stubborn and just super stubborn. And I want to be better. And I'm going to be more right than Jeff. Like that's really that that comes from. So all the listeners know that. Uh, what's your take on Sam Laporta though? Because I, I think Laporta is at 15. There's some people that really believe in Sam Laporta um, in that offense. And, and obviously tied into coming off the board. Um, I, I've seen him as high as 12. Um, I see people draft him before Mayor. Um, so what do we think with Sam Laporta, Jeff? I really wish tight ends didn't have the kind of development curve that they have because with Jameson Williams out of that offense, I, for the first half of the season, I could see Laporta stepping in and being an immediate contributor long-term. I am very, I like Laporta's talent quite a bit, but that being said, I know Christian talked last week about the potential loss of Ben Johnson as the offensive coordinator. And I think when you really stack it up, he's going to be the fourth option for a lot of his career, a lot of his early career behind Amon Ross St. Brown, behind Jamison Williams and behind Jameer Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs is going to see heavy yeah. usage in the passing game. And so that's kind of where I land on the Porta. I, it's like, I, I like potentially that, but at the same time, I, I just think that it's going to be very, very crowded for his early portion of his career, creating potential disappointment opportunities, creating potential buy opportunities for what player that I do believe is very talented. Yeah, I mean, that's these three tight ends were very similar in my pre draft rankings, and then they all kind of went into uniquely good situations. I, you know, I think you can argue that the Raiders situation is not good for Mayer. But then you kind of look at what the weapons are, and I think Mayer definitely has a, a clear role. Now, if he's he might not be the starting tight end, I, I think that's one thing about his rookie year. And, and the, that's it, you know, Trey McBride had that similar thing happen where, you know, he, he was valued really highly. I think he still held that a little bit, but, you know, he didn't really get on the field a whole lot. And so I that's my one concern with Mayer on the Laporta front no one he's he's on the field and and yeah. when you're looking at that first six games of Jamison Williams being gone I think that's when you see a, an increase in in his value it's similar to TJ Hawkinson's rookie year actually with the Lions as well not to helmet scout but Hawkinson had that boom week one and then you know he was already this elite tight end um, and then he never he, he lost value for a second there and then you know he got to a team that actually utilized him I do wonder what Laporte's usage looks like uh, you pass that six game stretch. And then like Jeff said, after Ben Johnson is gone at a head coaching job. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I like Waller this year. If he stays healthy, um, if, if you're looking at it, but from a dynasty standpoint, it's hard. If you're going to wait on the guys though, and you feel like, Hey, I want to try to go win now build Waller's someone that stands out to me. Dolchitz is just someone I'm staying away from altogether. Uh, he's a he's a social media darling. I feel like I don't necessarily know because he can draft a little higher than this in, in D dynasty drafts. Um, just a heads up there. Anyone else in this tier? Or we're gonna go to tier five. I mean, I I did the Greg Dolchitz spotlight, and so I'm gonna mention that. But uh, I think that if he runs a na very narrow outcome, that he could deliver quite a bit on that. But I mean, that's another guy that I think that Peyton wants to use him as the big slot essentially as that third receiver. And that is a pretty deep uh, wide receiver tree, tree and wide receiver room. But I think that I would not be surprised if Adam, Adam Troutman out snaps him this year, but I would be shocked if Adam Troutman out targeted him. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go to tier five. So tier five, we, okay. We got a bunch of guys here again, 18 Jatavian Sanders. So if you don't know who Jatavian Sanders is, he is a, Tied in for Texas, you were that. This is just a projection in terms of what he can be, his athleticism, and all that. We have 19 at Cole, Cole Komet, 20 is Chig Conquo. Look at that. It's Christian would laugh when I said that. Uh, 21 is Luke Musgrave, 22 is Noah Fant, 23 is Dawson Knox, and 24 is Tucker Craft. Uh, you know, what, what let's talk about a Conquo. Uh, Jeff, what do you think about him? Because he's been talked about as like the sleeper tight and everybody's going to grab. And I kind of always say I go away from those guys because those guys always disappoint you because people talk them up and then they disappear. But what, what is your take there? I think he's going to heat up as redraft season goes on as dynasty season goes on. Um, 
I've kind of like, I believe 12. And so like, I'm kind of technically in on him just because there is so much open volume in that offense. Now, that being said, I mean, there was a rumor today that DeAndre Hopkins was potentially going to be visiting the team. And so if they had DeAndre Hopkins, I think that Okonkwo falls out pretty hard because I think that Hopkins and Burks, I don't expect them to throw the ball a lot. I do expect that when they do, I think that Tajay Spears will be involved in the passing game more than what they've traditionally had running backs involved in the passing game. And um, I just think there'll be a lower volume offense and adding Hopkins into that mix suddenly takes a wide open target tree and crowds it very, very quickly. And I think Okonkwo is the guy that falls out. Yep, I'm really high on him this year simply because of uh, I have no idea who else is getting targeted. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I think this is a, a prime Tajay Spears point of, of discussion. I think the weird thing, though, is Okonkwo wasn't, you know, that traditional work underneath tight end, similar to Dallas Goddard. He was a field stretching tight end. Um, he was able to kind of work vertically a little bit. And I think if that continues, when you look at this roster, you've got uh, Traylon Burks who can also fill a role downfield, but I think your best bet is to use Traylon in the intermediate areas. Then you've got Kyle Phillips probably is what I would say is this wide receiver two on this team right now. And that's very clearly a slot guy. He's going to work underneath. He can win uh, vertically every once in a while, but then you fit in Chigo Conquo into what this offense is trying to be. And I tried to be out on him and I just, I could not, I could not be out on him with, with how I projected it. And so, um, you know, I think this is one of those, you know, breakouts that everyone's on. And I, you know, I, I traditionally go with, with what you said, Kevin is like kind of fade what everyone else is doing and, and go with a different late round sleeper. But this is one that I just can't get away from. I I think he's going to be a productive guy. And then, you know, I, I looked at my rankings and I bumped him up quite a bit uh, right as we were doing the show um, as I was updating, because I think once you know the Hopkins situation obviously would would impact that. But I think it, it, as is a Conquo is set for a top 10 season for sure, in my opinion. This tier feels weird to me because like the only guy maybe I'd be comfortable taking at, is Chig, right? Like in this tier of like, I think he could produce for me. I'd be happy with that. Um, I feel like you need to get in that tier four though. If you're going to wait in a tight end, like you want to maybe one of these guys in tier five, be your tight end too. If you're going to wait that long in terms of where you're drafting in your dynasty drafts. Um, and like that, an interesting parent would be like Waller and Chig. Like if you can get Waller this year, he's going to produce, maybe be that, maybe get lead the team in targets. Um, then you grab, you know, a conquer later. Like that could be an interesting kind of grab there. It really depends though. Cause what Jeff's talking about is going to happen and we're already seeing it kind of in the ADP. It's, it's starting to rise. And so that's, that's the question there. A lot of these other guys in this tier, I don't know. Cole Komet is there. Uh, Luke Musgrave, no fan. Dawson Knox is there. Tucker craft is there. Um, any, anybody else in this, in this tier, um, stand out to you, Jeff, or like, eh, maybe I'll take a shot at him. I mean, if you're playing the, the game of like week to week, plug a guy in. I just need a, a top 12 tight end finish because the guy tech catches a touchdown. I mean, Dawson Knox is showing that red zone usage to kind of merit mention there. And he's kind of, he's just uh, left for dead with the addition of Dalton Kincaid, but I think that he's still going to be on the field all the time. And so, and he finished last year, very, very strong. Um, I think he ended up the second half of last year, he was like tight in six or something like that, tight in eight maybe. I'm, I'm going off the top of my head here. Um, so that's a guy that's kind of lingering out there in a high-volume, high-ability offense. I can't believe you're just throwing Luke Musgrave out, Kevin. That was your dude. And and I think that I mean, as you look at you know the Packers being – pretty open in terms of targets i mean that could you know maybe Jaden reed christian's dude develops very quickly and and uh, christian watson is still there but musgrave's got a shot but i know christian's got a, it makes a really good point that it could be musgrave or it could be craft either way it could break either direction yeah and i think that's a good reason to have them rank so closely here uh in this tier because i you know, I, I, they offer different skill sets, and I think this could be one of those situations where you're looking at, you, you know, the Eagles with uh, Ertz and Goddard for those few years. I think that could be an outcome that happens this year with that wide receiver room. I know, you know, Romeo uh, uh, Dobbs is getting a lot of buzz as a, one of Jordan Love's favorites, but 
I think when you look at that receiver room, there's a ton of opportunity. Now, I don't expect them to maybe do that this first year, but I think, you know, as they continue to develop that offense, because this will be the first year that they have heavy two tight end usage. They traditionally were a one tight end team uh, in terms of targets. They, obviously, they used a lot of heavy personnel, but I do think that both of these guys could earn quite a few targets here in the future. Quickly on, you know, we have Komet up here. Um, that's a guy that, it, it's similar to Dawson Knox, where like if you need a guy and you need to plug him in and you're just, to, you know, hoping for a touchdown, he was, he, he found the end zone a, a decent amount during that nice stretch of, of Justin Fields' good passing production. So I think when you look at what that offense could potentially be, if you expect a, an increased efficiency, which I do, I think Komet could be one of those guys that he just snags a few touchdowns and, and, get you back end tight end one production similar to how Knox probably will at times this year. Do you think that Robert Tunyon messes it up at all for Komet? Do you think that they, I, I just don't know that Komet's a difference maker. And I think that we saw, we saw last year, I think that was probably Komet's best opportunity maybe of his career to be a major passing element and, and he was okay, but then they went around and, and got Robert Tunyon right away. So, the way so i'm in some bears chats now because i'm a bears fan um <laughs> and uh i'm a new bears fan i should clarify uh so i think they brought in tanyan to be the role that Komet had last year which is a field stretching guy a guy that can win vertically i don't think that's Komet's best skill set but i think that is very much so an element of this offense and they wanted someone that could do that that being said, I think that puts Komet back into a role that he is more suitable for, which is that possession guy, that chain mover, that guy that can win, uh, you know, down in the red zone inside the 10 and things like that. So I don't expect big things that, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of receiving options in that offense that I expect massive numbers from, but I do think that he could be one of those guys that gets more targets because he's not always downfield, even though that's where Justin Fields wins uh, or is best sometimes. But I do think that he can be one of those reliable possession type tight ends instead this year. You know this episode's going off the rails when we say Robert Tunyon field stretcher. Um, all right, let's uh, let's let's. Whoa, are we done with tight ends? I think we're done with tight ends here. Uh, so we look at it, like I, I will just say as an overarching kind of theme, and then I'll ask these guys that too. Is like you really want to get someone in tier one, <laughs> and if you if it's like you really want to target Pitts and Andrews and Kelsey, and if if something out of that happens, like I feel like when you're going at it, Hawk is a good, you know, these guys are kind of turn me on to Hawk a little bit on this, on this podcast in terms of like what he maybe can have moving forward. But after that, a lot of it's projections and like at anything at the tight end position, it's like, Hey, projecting forward. Um, we have one guy saying Dalton Kincaid is a top five guy. Right. And then you, we have Michael Mayer a little ahead of it. So we're all projecting here. Um, any big like overarching takeaways before we get out of here, Jeff? I, I don't know. I love the tight end position. I'm excited to see what the league is doing with having two tight ends more on the field quite often. And then um, I do think that we have a, a low key, a very good crop of young up and coming tight ends that um, the situation is very, very prime for them because um, it, it just, we don't, it doesn't seem like we have a group of older tight ends because there's big questions around Darren Waller and George Kittle's mm -hmm. kind of falling off. And, um, I, George Kittle's not falling off. I rewind that, but yeah. George Kittle's still kind of, in terms of volume, might be falling off or being a fantasy option, and and it just kind of feels like that that class is aging out a little bit, and and you've got a lot of young guys primed to step up, and who's going to be the next group? And we're kind of at a precipice of that. Yeah, yeah, and as far as like Debbie goes and college football goes, like. There are there are guys coming, Brock's coming, but after Brock and in, in, in college football right now, there's a lot of question marks at the tight end position too. So like that's just something to note. Uh, last last thing thought, Christian, before we get out of here. Yeah, uh, I was actually going to say something in that in that vein. You know, tight ends are tough to project because you have a guy like Don Kincaid that comes out of nowhere uh, and is the top tight end off the board last year, and so. Um, you know, I think when you look at the, you, you know, you have Brock, I feel pretty good about Jatavian Sanders, which we didn't talk about. And then after that, it's just a lot of projection. You know, I think Jake Brining stool is still good over at yes. Clemson. I, I think that's a guy that could be a, a riser, even though he wasn't a producer, but that's the thing. College offenses don't traditionally have productive tight ends. And so when you see a mixture of production and athleticism, and then they enter the draft, 
those guys typically get good draft capital and end up falling into, you know, this group where we find work them into the top 24 in some form. So, yeah, but I'm sure we'll have more, you know, college names to talk about this time next year. It's just we, they need to reveal themselves a little bit here in the 2023 college football season. Well, I, th- I think we make good points. And if we're going to step into the Debbie landscape, step into the college football landscape on those tight ends and having lower production in the, at the college level, because um, it, a lot of what you see, it's a, just a difficult position to be able to block and be able to catch and be able to do those things. And so when you're asking an 18, 19 year old kid, you're just not going to build your offense around that. You're going to build your offense around the wide receivers, allow the tight end to kind of be that extra lineman occasionally break out I and mean, we see that with offenses like Alabama and with Ohio State and, and just not really utilizing the tight end at all because you can get such good wide receivers that you want the ball in their hands and so that that is what creates a lot of the projection and uncertainty yeah. on both Debbie tight ends but also the allows the ability the guys to come out of nowhere. I didn't know we were going deep in Debbie. Let me give you a couple names here to watch. Um, <clears throat> Bryson Nesbitt, North Carolina. Watch him. Bryson Big Nesbitt's going to come out of there. Drake May kind of made him look good last year. So if you're looking for like that next guy that's eligible next year for looking at that, and then Jalen Connors, uh, Conyers from Arizona State. Those two guys have that opportunity, I think. You know, as a 23 class, um, I think Trigg's in the 23 class too. Michael Trigg, he plays for Ole Miss. Um, those guys, you know, if Michael Trigg played a spring game every game, he'd have like 2,000 yards. But poor kid cannot produce in the season, so we're hoping he does that. Um, but Nesbitt is a guy that I've been really on lately for North Carolina. If you want to watch go draw to Drake May, who's QB2 right now of the class, you'll see Nesbitt. He'll pop up every once in a while. He profiles as that tight end that you're like, oh, hey, that kid's pretty good. Maybe he can project a little bit like Jeff was talking about. So that's that's a kid. Got to give him a shout out in there because I do think that he can maybe take that next step um, when we're talking about the 24 class moving forward. So appreciate you guys tuning in here to the tight end show. We hope we made it interesting and we dropped some hot takes for the socials. Uh, we just got to say what sleeper, sleeper, sleeper. Uh, but we'll be back next week. We're done with positions now. We'll be diving into something else. We're going to tease that. It's going to be exciting. Next week, June 15th, we'll be on 1 p.m. Eastern. Until then, I'm Kevin Coleman. I'm Jeff Bell. And I'm Christian Williams. And you just watched the Football Guys College Football Show. 